Hello, friends and listeners. Welcome to Truth, Lies, and Alibis, the true crime podcast from three friends sharing their perspectives from having years of 911 dispatching experience. Episode 4, Where the Crystals Are. On today's episode, Kylie, Brittany, and I discuss the disappearance of Susan Cox Powell and the murder of her sons, Charlie and Brayden. Today's question is, have you ever said the words... Our officers have to take care of the life or death calls first to a caller that you can remember. Or have you heard? Yeah, I think, you know, not those exact words, but it's um, explaining the high priority or the life or death. Yeah, I guess I've probably used the term life or death before. Explaining to somebody that the non-injury accident is going to have to wait for an available officer because they're busy handling something that's a little bit more higher priority. And then being careful with that and explaining high priority doesn't mean that your call isn't important. It just they very well could be handling an actual life and death call. Yeah, I've I'll admit to that. I, I don't think I've used those exact words, but I have told people like, like if they're calling in for like a follow up or a message and they're really antsy about getting a call back, I've been, I've told them like, well, we've got some like higher priority calls that are happening right now, but um, as soon as I have an officer available, I'll have them give you a phone call. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not, not that, or like if I've had to explain to them, like not that your call's not important to us, it's just that we have like medical emergencies happening or Mm -hmm. emergencies happening that as soon as one breaks away and is available I'll have them call you or meet with you yeah I feel like that can happen quite frequently on the busy weekends especially like Friday Saturday nights when everybody has something happening and so you have to you know you only have so many officers available so they have to handle those higher priority ones I feel like you kind of have to be careful when you say those words and like you were saying, explain it in a better way. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you today's story because the dispatcher in today's story says those words. Um, On February 5th, 2012, a social worker, Elizabeth Griffin Hall in Polyup, is that how you say that? Washington? I have, I don't, I don't know. (laughs) I'm sorry, sure. I can't help. <laughs> <laughs> Called 911 reporting that she was supervising a visit between a biological father and his two sons when the father shut the door on her and wouldn't let her inside. The father, Josh Powell, was not supposed to be alone with the children per a court order. The social worker tells the 911 dispatcher that shutting her out is unusual and that she could hear a child crying and the father still wouldn't let her in. You can hear that she's confused and that she's upset, and she also tells the 911 dispatcher that she smells gasoline. I'm going to play some of that 911 call. Reporting. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit, and something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house, and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. Okay, that's pretty important for me to know. Um, sorry, I can't. Just a minute. Let me get in my car and see if I can, if I can find it. I'm, this, nothing like this has ever happened before at um, these visitations, so I'm really um, shocked. And I could hear one of the kids crying, but he still wouldn't let me in. Okay, it is uh, one. Oh, just a minute. I have it here. You can't find me by GPS. No. Okay, it is. Um, But I think I need help right away. He, he's on a very short lease with CSHS, and CPS has been involved. And this is the craziest thing. He looked right at me and closed the door. Are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm just waiting to know where you are. Okay. It's 8119 189th Street, Court East, 2 Alec, 98375. 
And I'd like to pull out of the driveway because I smell gasoline and he won't let me in. You want to pull out of the driveway because you smell gasoline, but he won't let I you... Smell, he, he won't let me in. He won't let you out of the driveway? He won't let me in the house. Whose house is it? He's got kids in the house and he won't let me in. It's a supervised visit. I understand. <laughs> Whose house is it? Josh Powell. Okay, so you don't live there, right? No, I don't. No, I'm okay. contracted to the state to provide supervised visitation. I see. Okay. And, and who is there to exercise their visitation? I am. Uh, and the visit is who? with Josh Powell. And who supervises? And he is the husband that I supervise. So you supervise and you're doing the visit? Yeah, you're I supervise You supervise yourself? I supervise myself. I'm the supervisor here. Wait a minute. If it's a supervised visit, you can't supervise yourself. If you're the I visitor. do supervise myself. I'm the supervisor for the supervised visit. Okay. Well, aren't you the one make, Aren't you the one making the visit, or is there another parent I'm the one, that you're supervising? No. There's. I'm the one that supervises. I pick up the kids as their grandparents. Yes. And then who visits with the children? Josh Powell. Okay. So you're supposed to be there to supervise Josh Powell's visit with the children. Yes, that's correct. And, how did and he's the husband of missing Susan Powell. How did he, how, this is a high profile case. How did he how did he gain access to the children before you got he there? Grabbed, they, they, I was one step in back of them. Okay, so they he went into the house the and then he door. locked you out. Yes. He, okay. he shut the door right in my face. All right, now it's clear. Your last name? My name is Elizabeth Griffin Hall. Griffin Hall is hyphenated? Yes. And what's your phone number, Elizabeth? Um, this, this cell phone number is 360-990-9955. And what agency are you with? Foster Care Resource Network. And the kids have been in there by now approximately um, 10 minutes. And he knows this children? is a supervised visit. Two. Braden is uh, five and Charlie is seven. And the dad's last name? Powell, P O W E L L. Two L's. Two L's at the end of Powell. Yes. His first name. His first name is Josh. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Native. He's white. Date of birth. I don't know. He's about thirty-nine. How tall? Um, five ten, one hundred and fifty pounds. Hair color. Brown. Did you notice what he was wearing? No, I didn't notice what he was wearing. Is he alone then, or is anybody I else? don't know. I couldn't get in the house. Right. Are you in a vehicle now or on foot? I'm in a vehicle. I'm in a Prius. On, um, a 2010 Prius what with the it? doors locked, but he won't. He hasn't opened the door. Ma'am, I rang the doorbell and everything. What, what color I begged him to let me in. Elizabeth, please listen to my questions. What color is the Toyota Prius? Gray, dark gray. And the license number? Um, I don't know. I can look. Seven five zero ZMH. Zebra Mary Henry. Yes. All right. We'll have somebody look for you there. Okay. How long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy. Well, this could responding. this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he he didn't get his kids back. And this is really I'm a, I'm afraid for their lives. Okay. Has he threatened the lives of the children previously? I have no idea. All right. We'll have the first available deputy contact you. Thank you. Bye. Hello? Hi, ma'am. Will you 
calling about the fire in the 8200 block of yes, 188th Street, the house. Ma'am, yes, do you know the, the house. Okay, do you know the exact address of the house, or are yes, you able to? It's 8119 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8,
the first time that she called, it seemed like he was frustrated with her. And in a way, I kind of get it because the information she was giving wasn't, she was freaking out, right? So she wasn't knowing what to say or how to say it. But her saying this could be a life-threatening situation, the kids could be in danger, I'm fear for their lives. I was like, how, how is he not taking that into account? I mean, she smells gas. So to me, that's super suspicious, right? And so then the second time she's calling in, she's calling because the house is on fire. So I'm sure she was probably also not only freaking out, but she was frustrated because she felt like she had already called. Yeah. And no one had come yet. Yeah. Well, I think right? I think some of that, one of it's that de- there's definitely miscommunication between what she's trying to convey and what that dispatcher is understanding. But I think... And we've touched on this before, right? It comes down to, it sounds to me like there he didn't quite understand what she meant by a supervised visitation. Yeah. The fact that this person is not allowed to see their children for one reason or another determined by the courts because they're a danger. They're not supposed to be alone with their children. So, that, that like, that's what that means is that there's legally supposed to be another person in there. And the fact that he is kicked them out, I can, I can see where the, like they have to handle life and death emergencies first. I can see that, but listening to those details of like, again, when she describes the gasoline, it sounds like he thinks she's smelling it outside, not coming from the house. So perhaps yeah. clarifying, like, okay, so you're smelling gasoline, but you think it's coming from the house. Like, there's none of that. Like, he's kind of done, I think, by that point. Yeah. Ready to handle the, put in the call and go to the next one. Yeah. And, I mean, they could have been busy at that time, too. But also, I feel like you had a good point, like, asking, oh, you smell gasoline. Where do you smell it coming from? Yeah. Like, where is that smell coming from? Yeah. And who knows, he could have been... Maybe because like we would have calls, right? So you think, well, obviously this is like a civil matter. Like what Mm -hmm. would you title it? And maybe he upped the priority of it. So Mm -hmm. it could just be like he was saying what he needed to say. But when he got, I mean, who knows what, who knows everything, right? But maybe he did say like, hey, like that's kind of a big deal or that could turn into something. Maybe we should get the next officer out to it. Who knows what was done on that end? But I I do think that there was a lot of time spent on trying to figure out the supervising part of it mm-hmm. when he he probably could have asked more about like the gasoline or maybe why dad wasn't allowed to hang out with kids. Yeah. That kind of questioning. But who knows what what was done for the priority of that call. Yeah, I think that as much as the miscommunication and stuff can kind of be explained aside and like reasoned with what happened and we've all either A, heard it in the room with you, or B, been responsible for it. But that snap of that attitude back, wait, how are you performing supervisor if you have to be the supervisor? That, I'll admit, I've been guilty of being snippy like that, but that doesn't make it okay. Like that to me, she's already frustrated. You're already frustrated. So by escalating that is only going to make situations worse. I think another frustrating thing of that is it just brings it around back to that compassion fatigue that's and that burnout that so many Mm -hmm. people in dispatch or law enforcement encounter and not having whether you as the dispatcher think that you have that compassion fatigue or you have that burnout or not that environment that law enforcement is in or law enforcement or dispatch or whatever you want to call it that that compassion fatigue and that burnout that like everybody encounters rather quickly in that line of work and the frustrations that you deal with day in and day out over long shifts in the same room, not really having another outlet or room to grow in that profession. It like wears on you. And eventually like, I don't know, like sometimes you just get to the point where you pick up the phone and you're like, okay, here we go again. Or Mm -hmm. it's like the caller becomes the same caller. Yes. The story becomes the same story. And you feel like you've heard it all or that it's just it, you almost feel like you're just going through the motions to get through the day to be done with your shift. And I know that I've felt that burnout or that fatigue. And I know that 
I'm not the only one. So I can kind of understand it. Like who knows how long this guy has been dispatching or if he's having a frustrating day or what all the circumstances are that let play into this. But it's just a kind of reminder that there's room to grow and progress in an environment that, that dispatchers are in all the time. Yeah. I will admit that I've probably kind of had a snappy attitude here or there, you know, yeah. when we're busy. I feel like you said it, we're all guilty of it. But did you notice what she said? She said, he's the husband of missing Susan Powell. Yes. It's a high profile case. Yeah kind of pointing out there's more to this story that you need to take into account i just thought it was interesting because she like i don't know it also it's like i said it's frustrating because she's not giving the information in kind of a clear way like you know what i mean like i don't think i also i also might not have understood what she was saying right away so it's kind of frustrating in that point it's just a whole the whole thing is frustrating and sad I know we've all had those days where things have been so slammed and you really are, you're picking up phone after phone after phone while you're working the radio and your radios are nonstop. So you're just trying to get through the call to the next call. And like, it's frustrating because you don't know what the RP is really trying to say to you. Mm -hmm. You're trying to figure it out. Not that anybody like was negligent or meant to do anything or any harm. It just, it was like one of those, the domino effect of just pure chaos happening that all these really unfortunate series of events happen. Like the worst case scenario was the worst case scenario. Yeah. And that's kind of how I think you should think about it every time you pick up that phone. Just remember, you don't want this to come back and be a moment where you're like, oh, dang. Which I think is the whole reason people evaluate 911 calls or they bring them up so that maybe that mistake isn't made again. You know? Well, it's calling to light. And I've said, I don't know if I've said it on the podcast in a recording before, but that the second we stop admitting that there's room for improvement or that things went wrong is the second that we fail categorically across the board. I agree. It's, it's important to highlight things like this because, you know, if it were me, and I still worked in dispatch and I happen to come across this podcast and I'm listening to an episode or anything, right? Like they have the PLS trainings where you listen yeah. to those. You have the, I don't know, whatever the different agencies use to evaluate those 911 calls. You get a chance to listen back and you do identify something that you do. And so it's it's that self-improvement as well that like that training that training that I just took, that PLS, like... That has a point. You definitely need to make sure to reevaluate how you're handling things because it may be your 100th 911 call of the day, but more than likely it's that reporting party's first 911 call of the day. In the call, the social worker tells the dispatch he's the husband of the missing person, Susan Cox Powell. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Susan. Missing mother, Susan Cox Powell, was last seen December 6, 2009, when a neighbor visited her home at 1700 which is 5 p.m. The next day, December 7th, when Josh's mother and sister couldn't reach the family after receiving a call that the boys had not been dropped off at daycare, they went to the family's home. After failing to make contact with the family, they reported the entire family missing. The police broke into the family home in case they were victims of carbon monoxide poisoning, and no one was in the household, but they did find two large box fans blowing at a wet spot on the couch. Susan had failed to show up at work that day, and her purse, wallet, and ID were found at the house. Her cell phone would later be found in the family's Chrysler Town & Country minivan that Josh had been driving at the time. At 5 p.m. on December 7th, Josh returned home with the boys and then was taken to the PD to be questioned. He told officers that he had last seen Susan when his sons and him left after midnight to go camping at Simpson Springs in western Utah. And I have to point out that it was like a full-on blizzard, and they left after midnight. Yeah, I mean, not not my ideal vacation. (laughs) With two young children, because they were toddlers at the time, basically, right? And he had to work, because it's a Sunday night. So he had to work hours later. Police thought that his story was suspicious, which I agree. He explained that he thought it was Sunday, not Monday. That doesn't make sense either, because the boys and Susan had gone to church that morning, right? So if they typically went to morning on Sunday, or to church on Sunday morning... The investigators thought he seemed to lack any emotion and didn't seem to be worried about his missing wife. They searched Scott's van and find some camping gear in the vehicle. They also visited the Simpson Springs area and could find no evidence of a campsite in the area. When the police searched the Powell residence two days later on December 9th, they found traces of Susan's blood on the floor 
and paperwork about a $1.5 million life insurance policy from Susan and a handwritten letter where Susan herself stated she feared for her life. The investigators also had the children sit down for a a safe child interview. At least that's what it looked like to him or Mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. When they asked Charlie, who was five at the time, who they went camping with, he says his dad, his mom, and his brother. He also says his mom stayed at the park where the crystals are. And I'm going to give you a little backstory on how Josh and Susan met. So Josh Powell was born on January 20th of 76. His parents had a dysfunctional marriage. According to divorce records, the couple fought over Stephen's dissatisfaction with the LDS church. And Stephen, Josh's father, also refused to enforce or teach certain behaviors. And he began sharing porn with Josh and his two brothers at a young age. As a teen, Josh allegedly killed his sister's gerbils and threatened his mother with a butcher knife, and he had also used physical force against his mom. He had attempted suicide at least one known time, and Stephen had tried to discourage his children's involvement with the LDS church, so Josh was confused on that a little bit growing up. He lived in Seattle while he was attending the University of Washington, and in 1998, he began a relationship with a young woman he had met at an LDS church event. The two eventually moved in together, and Josh became possessive over her. She would later say, He would have restrictions and limitations on what I could and couldn't do and when it came to my family. The couple eventually broke up because of all the restrictions that he had in place for her. And then in November of 2000, at a church function for singles, Josh met Susan. And the two began to date in August of 2001. The couple married. The Susan Cox Powell Foundation describes Susan as the third daughter of Charles and Judy Cox, and she was 28 years old when she was reported missing on December 7th. She was born in New Mexico and lived in Alaska before her family settled in Washington State when she was a child. She and her husband later moved to Utah, and they describe her as a devoted mother to her two small boys, and her family and friends know that she would never voluntarily be separated from them. Susan is outgoing, optimistic person with a servant's heart and boundless energy. She is characterized by her faith in her heavenly father, her determination to provide for her children, and her belief that families are forever. Her faith is an example for others, including her two boys. For a brief period of time after their wedding, the couple lived with Josh's father, Stephen. Stephen began to develop an obsession with Susan. In 2003, Stephen confessed that he was in love with her. And it's all caught on camera. There there are tons of documentaries that you can watch about it. And I'm sure on YouTube you can find all the videos. But apparently he took lots of videos of her. And he had recorded this conversation where he had said that he was in love with her. And she rejected him. And then the Powells moved out of state soon after that. Partly so she could distance herself from him. Josh had a degree in business and worked for multiple companies over the years. Susan tried like cosmetology school and then she went to work for Wells Fargo. The couple would go on to have their two sons, Charles and Brayden. Susan kept journals throughout this time and wrote about the tension of her marriage. She writes about how Josh didn't want to go to church and was controlling. She was upset that Josh continued to speak to Stephen frequently, even after he admitted that he was obsessed with her and they had moved to get away from him. She was also upset about his spending habits. The couple had to file for bankruptcy in 2007, and she recorded a video in July of 2008 surveying property damage she attributed to Josh. And she wrote a secret will that included the statements, I want it documented that there is extreme turmoil in our marriage, and if I die, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. Wow. While Scott was spending all her money on things the family didn't need, she told her friends that he managed all the money and he would only give her so much for groceries or like anything that they needed. Her friends say that Susan would sometimes have to call and ask them for food to feed the kids because she didn't have enough. And he wouldn't buy Christmas presents for the kids. He was really strict on what kind of money she got, but he could buy whatever he wanted. The two had one vehicle and she, I was watching a documentary and it said she had to bike like seven miles to work every day and home. Jeez. Because yeah, they only had the one vehicle. She also admitted to her friends that at least once he was physical with her. So based on this, I think Susan was not only a victim of like physical domestic violence, but economic as well, because he was controlling everything. Uh, was any of that ever reported? Do we know? No. She yeah. never reported it, which oftentimes we know people don't report it. 
kind of well, like it can have a lot of pressure Gabby. from their church as well. Yeah, and I know Josh wasn't as involved in the church, but Susan apparently Sounds really was and was like really strict with her religion, and they didn't believe in divorce. On December twenty fourth, Josh was named as a person of interest in the case. He then packs up his children in the middle of the night again and moves back in with his father. Josh goes on to do some interviews and accuses Susan's parents of abusing her. And together, Josh and Stephen make a website and write about how Susan probably ran off with a Stephen Kocher, who's a 30-year-old who disappeared in Las Vegas, Nevada, a few weeks after Susan went missing. However, there's no indication that Stephen and Susan even knew each other. And they also write about how Susan possibly fell in love with another man and ran off with him based on information they say is in her journals. When he packed up and he left, he also took all of her stuff, including all of her journals. In 2011, investigators seized computers and other evidence from Stephen's house after learning from a friend that he was obsessed with Susan. On the computers, they find around 4,500 images of Susan that were taken without her knowledge. Jesus. They found journals Stephen had written about his obsession with Susan and songs he had written about her. Like, you can go on YouTube, I think, and listen. I, I went and listened. No, it's to okay. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't. We don't have to listen now. But I went and listened because I was, when this case came out, I was like, what the heck? How have they not arrested him already? You know? And so I listened. It's super creepy. I don't recommend it. But if you want to, you can. They find Susan's underwear, used tampons, and other used items such as cotton balls. Yeah, he saved them in plastic bags. Yep. He also took videos of her that she didn't know about, like I said before. Yeah, and they're just creepy. Ugh, gives me the heebie-jeebies. And this is his dad? Yeah, her her father-in-law who, like, confessed that he was in love with her. and Yeah, he's just 100% creepy. Just 100%. Yeah, that's concerning behavior for sure. After receiving a tip from a detective in Boulder, Colorado, police also investigate Michael, Josh's brother. They found out he had sold his Ford Taurus to a wrecking yard in Oregon shortly after her disappearance, and the car seemed to be in good shape and didn't look like the typical car that you would sell to a wrecking yard. When they find the car, the cadaver dogs are taken to the salvage yard, and they indicate that there was a decomposing human body in the trunk at some point. They recover the car and take it back to Utah. However, DNA tests on the DNA evidence found in the vehicle were inconclusive. Stevens' computers also had videos and pictures of two underage neighbor girls. They find this out later. He was arrested for voyeurism and child pornography, and investigators hoped that this would make him give information on Susan's disappearance, like maybe he would give his son up if he knew anything. But unfortunately, he didn't give any information. The day after Stephen's arrest, Chuck Cox, Susan's father, filed for custody of Brayden and Charlie. A Washington court eventually granted Cox temporary custody of the boys, ruling that Joshua would have to move out of Stephen's house if he wanted to regain custody because it wasn't a safe environment for children, obviously, since he was living with a sex offender. Josh rented a house in South Hill, but authorities later alleged that he never actually moved into the house and he was just trying to appear as if he had moved out and he just wanted to get his kids back so based on josh's computer evidence on september 14th 2011 utah authorities discovered a possible grave site so they used his computer and they had found that he had searched an area so they found a possible grave site while searching topaz mountain a desert area near nephi that josh had frequented as a campsite There were signs of recent soil disturbance and shoveling, but after digging a few feet down, police were unable to find any remains in spite of carefully sifting through the soil. They ruled out the possibility of the site being in like an ancient burial ground or anything too, just so they think that there was probably a body there at some time, but they couldn't find any evidence of it. According to court records on January 31st, 2012, there had also been some questioning photos and videos found on Josh's computer that included 400 images of simulated child pornography, bestiality, and incest. So because of that, he had to undergo a psychological exam, and on February 1st, 2012, a judge ordered that the boys stay with Susan's parents, and that's when he was ordered to have supervised visits. 
According to KUTV, through the psychosexual exam, it's found that Powell has narcissistic personality traits shown by his inability to admit even small personal shortcomings or weaknesses. The examiner also finds that Powell has adequate parenting skills, steady employment, and no criminal record. The examiner decides to recommend the supervised visits, and he gets to see them like several times a week. Chuck Cox, Susan's father, didn't agree with the ruling and thought that the children should not go to the visitation, but because it was court-ordered, he knew he couldn't keep them from going. Investigators also found Susan had a safe deposit box, like throughout the years they figured out she had a safe deposit box, and within that deposit box, Susan had a video documenting her at the assets, and in the video she looks exhausted and says she hopes everything works out but friends say that she had told josh that if he didn't fix their relationship by their anniversary she was gonna leave him susan also spoke to a divorce lawyer around the time where she disappeared and he was the one who suggested that she make the video of all their assets so that he couldn't hide anything according to the battered women support services the statistics outline the reality that The most dangerous time for a survivor or a victim is when she leaves the abusive partner. I think we already kind of talked about this, but 77% of DV-related homicides occur upon separation, and there is a 75% increase of violence upon separation for at least two years after they leave. If Susan had finally threatened to leave her abusive relationship, he may have realized that he had finally lost control and thought that ki- by killing her, he could regain that control, and at least he would have his kids. I don't know. It's just not logical, so we're never going to know what he thought. Maybe he didn't want her to be happy. Maybe he just couldn't let her go. Which brings us to February 5th, 2012, when the social worker Elizabeth Griffin Hall made her 911 call. The boys had run to the house, and Josh grins at the caseworker and then locks her out. She can hear Josh say, Charlie, I have a big surprise for you. And then she hears Brayden scream. Josh burns the house down with himself, Charlie, and Brayden inside. And first responders cannot enter the house for hours because the fire is so intense. Mm. Probably because the gasoline he used. Yeah. Investigators were lo- will later state that it was a murder-suicide. And Josh had tried to kill Charlie and Brayden with a hatchet first. They had multiple marks from the hatchet. And that's probably why the social worker heard screaming before. Yeah, it's rough. And the hatchet was found by Josh's body. Or the cause of death for Charlie, Brayden, and Josh was carbon monoxide poisoning. And friends and relatives tell investigators that Josh had left a voicemail for them to say goodbye before he did this, saying he couldn't live without his sons. I don't want to talk about it too much because I hate any crimes involving children. I just think it's sad, but... Mm -hmm. The boys were found holding hands, which is also just heartbreaking. And it's just really sad that they had to go through that. On February 11th of 2013, Michael, Josh's brother, the one who had the Taurus, jumps off a roof of a parking garage in Minneapolis. How do you say? Minneapolis. There you go. And kills himself. In 2015, Chuck Cox won control of Susan's estate in a fight against the Powells. And the Cox family also sues Washington's Department of Social and Health Services stating that the agency prioritized Josh's parental rights, who I remind you was actively being investigated for a murder and a disappearance because they assumed at this point that Susan was dead. And he also had all that stuff on his computer and even through his exam, they knew he was narcissistic and still somehow said he had great parenting capabilities. I don't understand it at all. Well adequate that's such i don't know how do you argue that right like that adequate is supposed to mean that they can take care of their children but but is adequate really i don't that's just a it's just weird so what is adequate parenting right right? yeah absolutely that's what i want to know and shouldn't it come down to the safety of the community versus this like see in the safety of the children versus what adequate parenting is i understand for a lot of agencies who may not be law enforcement their main priority is still to prioritize the impact that the individual they're discussing has on the community and their family and whether they're safety threat or not Mm -hmm. so i would think that that would be the same for the the health and services department yeah that's what i would think right too but i can tell you from like personal experience and having to sever my ex's rights and so from my experience he almost killed one of my children right 
And I still had to go to court and prove that there was reason for me to sever his rights. That whole court process is way different than the sure. criminal por- court process, mm-hmm. which is, is kind of sad, right? Because sometimes the kids pay for that. Oh, uh, every time. And in this case, they did. Yeah, 100%. And I think it was good that they sued them. However, in a lower court, they ruled against the Cox family. And then later on, it was reversed. It's just, I, the whole system for that, like, family court, I will, I don't think I'll ever understand how they yeah. define adequate parenting. Yeah, because I think from, from an outsider's perspective, having no insight as to the law side of it or being on the, the other side of the bench going through the process, obviously you want safeguards around and involved because you don't want those circumstances in which the bad parent tries to take custody away from the good parent because that happens as well so those checks and balances are important but then you look on the on the reverse side of it and I think for a long time and even now people are courts and law and the minds behind it are so afraid to take children away from their biological parents which sometimes is the best thing you can do for a child a hundred percent agree It's, well, the grandparents want sole custody versus the biological father. As, I don't know, like, we could go into this for forever, but just because somebody is a biological parent does not mean they are the best to parent a child. No, so in this case, let's look at some of the quote-unquote evidence, right? He has shown a couple times he doesn't make very good parenting decisions, right? Taking his kids camping in the middle of a blizzard, let's just say. On top of that, one of the children says, mommy went camping with us, but she didn't return. He's being investigated for murder. He also has images on his computer. Granted, they're like cartoon images or, you know, animated images or whatever. No, it doesn't at all, right? Including incest. So please tell me how, you know what I mean? It just, none of it makes sense. And you're 100% right. Sometimes they're like so afraid that they're going to take this child away from their family, right? When in reality, that could be what protects them. It's like law enforcement or whether it's family court, all of that stuff would be what we would call a clue that this person may have some issues and they should, they may or may not be in a good position to have their children or be in the community it just seems like there's a lot like a lot of people fail susan and a lot of people fail the kids yeah 100 percent. it's like that tiktok where it's like red flag he just had a million red flags well and it's it's very apparent too right looking back on everything that they were able to gather it's very clear that joshua came from it's clear where his mental illness stemmed from he yeah. had a very close relationship with his father, who I'm I'm not a doctor, but I'd be willing to say that he had some <laughs> mental health issues. Hey, really? Like, what makes you what think you, that? What do you think? You Is know, it the used I tampons? I'm, I'm or... unable to make a clear diagnosis, but. <laughs> It's And even still, it looks like his brother as well, Michael, having dealt with all that, had the suicidal tendencies and ended up taking his own life. That all stemmed from somewhere. And from what what you've described of Stephen, the father, of what he had going on and the many mental hurdles that he went through were pushed onto his children. Yeah. And he had another sister who like stuck up for her dad and said her dad wasn't crazy and was 100% on their side. And there's like so much more like if you watch the documentaries, but I just kind of picked out the pertinent information really to put in this. But then there was another sister who was like, no, they were all insane. And at one point, that sister even went to a family dinner wearing a mic. She was wired to see if she could get anything, you know, and that's kind of ballsy. I need to point out too, because in the Gabby Petito episode, we talked about like narcissistic personality, right? And I was thinking, oh, they probably think so highly of themselves, they couldn't kill themselves. Well, apparently, after doing some more research, because my friend Tara pointed it out, narcissistic personality disorders, they typically are more prone to commit suicide. Ultimately, that's what he did. And pointing out that he has a narcissistic personality disorder, maybe they also should have taken that into account. Well, I think that's also him, the murder-suicide, right? That he needed to take his kids out with him. Well, he's taking out all the witnesses to his crime, too. Yeah. And he's controlling everything. He controlled Susan by making her disappear. 
And now he's yeah. controlling his son. On there is that the website with the accusation of the guy that went missing as well. That either one was just some BS that he was like, oh, this is somebody that I could, a name that I can throw out. More likely that stems from paranoia. That he was like, the delusion is there that Susan, you know, Susan left on her own. Susan disappeared. Everybody's saying that Susan disappeared. This guy's disappeared. Well, he's obviously involved because he disappeared around the same time. Even though they had, they didn't know each other. Yeah. There seems to be an awful a lot of that paranoia as well it's been a long time since i took my psychology classes so i don't remember <laughs> the names for everything it's delusional right it's just insane it the whole thing is insane in 2017 steven the dad was released for after serving seven years for those child pornography and voyeurism charges and then he died shortly after on july 23rd of 2018 of natural causes years later friends speculate that josh poisoned susan on the sunday she was last seen a friend was over for dinner and josh had made pancakes and according to susan's dad he had never cooked before that wasn't a normal thing for him after eating susan felt sick and went to lay down and they also think that josh may have attacked her in the home based on the blood droppings and the wet spot where the fans were blowing According to Crime Traveler, Josh would match the profile of a family annihilator. He had possessive <laughs> tendencies over his family, like we said, employment and financial issues, and a history of domestic violence. Some risks for family annihilators include a breakdown in the family relationship, a change in parental custody of the children, financial hardships, mental illness, and cultural honor killings so if you look at all those risks there was a breakdown in the family relationships right susan left then his dad was arrested then there was a change in parental custody of the children because he had to do supervised visits and then the mental illness part because he obviously had some mental illness yeah susan's body has never been found to this day i know that they still like the family still advocates for finding her i just don't I don't think that they'll ever find her. Were the police ever able to determine what the boy meant, what the son meant when he talked about she stayed with the crystals? No, but I think they think that he took her somewhere and left her there. Um, oh, yeah. Obviously not the campsite that they that he said he was at because there was no evidence that they For had sure. even been there. So there was a spot in Nephi Mountains that they thought where a burial had been. Yeah, that he had like looked up a couple times on his computer or something too. I wonder if he had originally buried her somewhere and then Dug dad the or brother or brother went back and yeah. when stuff started to happen and, and moved her. Yeah. I could see that yeah. happening. Yep. So I think, I definitely think it was probably Josh who killed her. But I think like you said, the brother and the dad were, they were all in on it, at least on hiding her body. Yeah. And keeping it a secret. So that's the case of Susan and her two sons, Brayden and Charlie. If you or someone you know thinks they're in a domestic violence situation, please visit the domestic violence support page or call 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. You can also text the word START to 8878. And if you or someone you know is in distress and feels like they can't go on, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit the Suicide Prevention website. Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at truthliesandalibis.com.